This training prepares emergency workers operating in Chester County's four reception centers that support York County residents following a nuclear power plant incident. Before we begin, it's important to note that civil nuclear power has been around for over six decades, with only two major reactor accidents, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Chernobyl involved an intense fire without provision for containment, and Fukushima severely tested the containment, allowing some release of radioactivity. There are over 18,500 cumulative reactor years for commercial nuclear power operations in 36 countries. The evidence of six decades shows that nuclear power is a safe means of generating electricity. It's also relevant to know that background radiation is a part of our daily lives. On average, the human body will receive over 600 millirems of ionizing radiation each year from natural and manufactured sources. A millirem is a small measure of energy, much like a millimeter is a small measure of length. Even following the most severe nuclear accident in U.S. history, the Three Mile Island incident, the surrounding area of 2 million people received an estimated 1 millirem of radiation exposure. This training is designed for emergency workers who support one of Chester County's four reception centers and sheltering sites, including Chester High School, Louisville Middle School, Louisville High School, and Great Falls High School. The reception centers serve York County, South Carolina individuals who are evacuated due to an incident at the Catawba Nuclear Station. The Catawba Nuclear Station in York, South Carolina, is located on a 391-acre peninsula. Concord Peninsula is the most remote section via car on Lake Wiley. The Catawba Station has two Westinghouse pressurized water reactors. Unit 1 began commercial operation in 1985, then Unit 2 in 1986. The station was designed and built with redundant safety systems using ice condensers as part of its emergency containment system. The plant uses uranium to generate electricity. The uranium produces heat, which in turn produces steam that turns turbines that rotate generators. The expended fuel from this activity creates the most significant hazard. Commercial nuclear power plants include a system for notifying the public and emergency response personnel if a problem occurs at a plant. There are four categories that define each emergency classification level. The lowest classification level is a notification of unusual events. An unusual event is a minor incident, often non-nuclear, such as a plant worker injury or severe weather. No public action is required. The next level up is an alert. An alert is an event that involves an actual or potential substantial degradation of safety, combined with a potential for limited uncontrolled releases of radioactivity from the plant. An alert is still a relatively minor incident and no public action is required. Next is a site area emergency. We'll cover the definition of a site area emergency in a moment. The highest emergency classification level is a general emergency. We'll discuss a general emergency momentarily. Chester County will be notified following a site area emergency or a general emergency by the Duke Emergency Management Network, also called DEMNET. Additional information on evacuation will be provided by the York County Office of Emergency Management. However, all Chester County agencies are notified at any declared emergency classification level status, from alert to general emergency statuses. Chester County Emergency Management will begin opening reception centers and shelters following a site area emergency notification. A site area emergency is the third in increasing significance and involves a major operational or security event affecting plant safety. Sirens may sound to alert the public to listen to local radio and television stations for information. Radioactivity levels outside of the plant should not exceed federal guidelines. Chester County will be open and operational to receive York County evacuees following a general emergency notification. A general emergency is the most critical of the four classifications 
and involves a serious operational event. Sirens may sound. State and local authorities would act to protect the public, and the local radio and television stations would provide information and instructions. Some measures would be likely to protect the public from radiation exposure. Protective measures may include the use of potassium iodide, also called KI, shelter in place, or evacuation. In addition, Chester County Emergency Management Agency will activate the Emergency Operations Center or EOC and provide support for agencies to establish reception centers to monitor, decontaminate, and shelter evacuees. It is estimated that Chester County would receive around 80,000 York County evacuees, with 20%, or approximately 16,000 of those arriving within the first 12 hours. Following a general emergency, the potential danger from a nuclear power plant accident is radiation exposure. This release of radioactive material into the environment is usually characterized by a plume or cloud-like formation of radioactive gases and particles. The plume would not necessarily be visible. However, in our example, we'll use a visible plume for illustration purposes. The radioactive material in the plume generates ionizing radiation. Exposure to ionizing radiation is the most significant hazard to people in the vicinity of the plume. Ionizing radiation means that the radiation has sufficient electrical charge or energy to interact with matter, including the human body. This interaction between ionizing radiation and living tissue can cause significant damage. When the dose is high enough, ionizing radiation causes two types of harm to humans. Direct tissue damage and cancer. Direct tissue damage happens when enough molecules break apart, causing the cells to cease functioning. Exposure to ionizing radiation can lead to radiation burns, radiation sickness, organ failure, and death. Ionizing radiation originates from unstable atoms, which have either an excess of energy, or mass, or both. To reach a stable state, they must release that extra energy, or mass, in the form of ionizing radiation. Once the atom releases the excess energy or mass, or both, it reaches a stable state. An analogy representing an unstable atom is a person carrying boxes. With too many boxes stacked up, the load becomes unstable. When the load becomes too unstable, that person will end up dropping some of the boxes until they reach a manageable amount. Reducing the number of boxes to stabilize the load would represent an atom's stable state. Let's look at where the ionizing radiation from a nuclear power plant incident originates. The Catawba nuclear plant uses uranium in the form of pellets in its power generation process. About 3% of the uranium in the fuel converts into fission products as a byproduct of energy generation. There are hundreds of fission products generated. Fission products are usually volatile. To reach a stable state, like the analogy of the boxes, they must release their excess energy, or mass, which is in the form of ionizing radiation. The ionizing radiation in the plume is dynamic and is affected by the passage of time, called half-life, and its interaction with matter, called attenuation. <laughs> When fission products release their excess energy, or mass, in the form of ionizing radiation, the process is called radioactive decay. In the process of decay, atoms eject electrons, called beta decay, and radiating energy, called gamma decay. Beta particles and gamma rays are two types of ionizing radiation. Remember, fission products are usually unstable. And because they're unstable, they decay, releasing ionizing radiation in the form of beta particles and gamma rays. The more unstable or radioactive a fission product is, the faster it will decay.
The speed of radioactive decay is measured in half-lives. Half-life can help determine how quickly a fission product will undergo radioactive decay after fission products go through the decay process and reach a stable state, they are no longer radioactive. The radioactive emission rate is highest for the shortest-lived fission products, which will also decay the fastest. Again, the products with the shortest half-lives will emit the highest amount of ionizing radiation, but will not continue to release at those high emissions for long. So, the threat of radioactivity decreases over time. Knowing the half-life helps determine how long the radioactive materials released in the plume will remain harmful to people and the environment. Although following a general emergency, there is a risk for exposure to ionizing radiation from beta particles or gamma rays. There is another factor that will significantly decrease the threat of dangerous levels of exposure. We talked about half-life, the other element includes a process called attenuation. Attenuation is when the number of beta particles or gamma rays entering a body of matter is reduced by absorption and scattering. This process weakens the radiation. An analogy of attenuation is a bug splattered on a windshield. When a pesky mosquito collides with a car's windshield, its body is scattered and absorbed by the glass. The process of hitting the glass has taken away all the bug's energy and it can no longer cause harm. In the case of radiation, sometimes not all the radioactive material is absorbed or scattered. Each time the beta particle or gamma ray interacts with matter, it loses a bit more energy until it no longer has enough energy to cause damage. When ionizing radiation passes through enough matter, creating attenuation, it loses energy or mass and is no longer radioactive. Although radioactive particles would typically fall vertically, the illustration shows how some radiation passes through unaffected while other radiation is absorbed or scattered as it interacts with the buildings, vegetation, and clouds. Radioactive particles carried into the atmosphere after a nuclear power plant incident gradually fall back to the ground as dust, ash, or precipitation, called fallout. We'll look at the plume's radioactive fallout and how individuals can become contaminated. There are two types of contamination, external and internal. Most external contamination will come from either fallout or transference. External contamination from fallout occurs when radioactive material comes into contact with a person's skin, hair, or clothing. Horizontal surfaces like the top of the head and shoulders, hands, and forearms, and all surfaces below the knees, are the most likely areas of contamination on individuals. Although these represent the most likely areas of contamination, whole body monitoring is still necessary to determine areas and levels of contamination. Horizontal surfaces on tires and fender wells, roofs, hoods, and trunks will be a vehicle's main potential for contaminated surfaces. Transference happens when individuals inadvertently come in contact with radioactive particles by touching, brushing against, or sitting on contaminated surfaces. In addition, people who have radioactive dust on their clothing may contaminate someone else by shaking hands or hugging others. Internal contamination occurs when radioactive material is inhaled, ingested, or enters through an open wound. To become contaminated, the person must be in contact with a radioactive source. All these factors may impact your county evacuees. Remember that during decay, fission products eject electrons called beta decay and radiating energy called gamma decay. Both are forms of ionizing radiation. The beta decay process produces ionizing radiation in the form of beta particles. 
Although they are physical particles, they are not visible to the naked eye. The gamma decay process produces ionizing radiation in the form of gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most energetic photons in the electromagnetic spectrum and are also invisible to the naked eye. Since both beta particles and gamma rays are invisible, exposure to radiation and possible contamination can only be determined by radiation detection equipment. Evacuees arriving at the reception centers in vehicles will first drive through a vehicle decontamination station. An average of 180 cars per hour can be washed through the mass vehicle decontamination station. The station is set up using a fire department ladder truck. The system washes the hood, roof, and trunk areas and uses a piped misting system to clean the sides and underside of the vehicle. This process provides full decontamination of the outside of the vehicle. Emergency workers will take steps to control runoff contamination, and contractors will remove contaminated water according to the Department of Health and Environmental Control requirements for harmful wastewater disposal. After parking their vehicles, evacuees are directed to walk through one of four portal monitors. Each portal monitor can monitor one person every 10 seconds or six per minute, totaling 360 per hour. The Ludlam 52-1 portal monitor has four alarm locations, two on the top and two on the bottom. The unit will alarm when it detects radiation levels at one microcurie. A microcurie is a very small unit of radioactivity. The portal monitor is the only radiation monitoring device present at Chester County reception centers that utilize a microcurie as a radioactive measurement. Each portal monitor is preset at the factory to detect an alarm at one microcurie or above, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA standard. Portal monitors require quarterly testing to ensure they continue to meet this FEMA standard. If an evacuee passes through the portal monitor without it alarming, they will receive a green wristband and go directly to registration and sheltering. If the portal monitor alarms when the evacuee passes through, they are considered contaminated. If this happens, two actions will occur. First, the evacuee will receive a red wristband and proceed to individual decontamination. Second, the vehicle monitoring team will monitor the interior of the car of the evacuee. The evacuee who is contaminated will be taken to male or female decontamination respectively. Once the evacuee arrives at the individual decontamination station, they will be monitored using a handheld Ludlam Model 3. The Ludlam uses counts per minute, which measures the detection rate of ionization events per minute. If contamination levels of 300 counts per minute or higher are detected, the evacuee will be required to wash the contaminated areas. The evacuee will have two opportunities to wash the contaminated area. If they are monitored after the first or second wash and found below 300 counts per minute, they will receive a green wristband and proceed to registration. If they are above 300 counts per minute after the second wash, they may have internal contamination that only trained medical professionals can treat. Emergency medical services will take the evacuee with contamination levels of 300 counts per minute or higher to the hospital. Each evacuee requires approximately 10 minutes for monitoring and decontamination. A total of six evacuees can be monitored and decontaminated per hour. So, six per hour in the female decontamination station and six per hour for the male. At the same time, the vehicle monitoring team will monitor the vehicle of the evacuee found contaminated at the portal monitor. If they locate contaminated areas inside the vehicle at 300 counts per minute or higher, the car will be quarantined.
Emergency workers will maintain five stations, which include vehicle decontamination, portal monitor, male decontamination, female decontamination, and vehicle monitoring. All emergency workers at each of the five stations will place a permanent record dosimeter or PRD on their inner garments. They will keep PRDs with them until the termination of the event. In some cases, this could span several days. Permanent record dosimeters or PRDs measure an individual's dose uptake of external ionizing radiation. It is a record of the radiation dose received throughout the event. All PRDs require processing to determine the radiation dose by a dosimetry processor. PRDs would be collected after the event and sent off for processing. One emergency worker from each station will wear a self-reading dosimeter outside their personal protective equipment. Individual emergency workers who travel from station to station or who otherwise traverse multiple areas will also wear a self-reading dosimeter outside their clothing. Radio callouts will remind emergency workers wearing self-reading dosimeters to record dosimeter readings. The radiological exposure records located in all station file boxes provide the radiation exposure limits and response actions required for each. The permanent record dosimeter, or PRD, and self-reading dosimeter, or SRD. Use a radiation-absorbed dose, or RAD, to measure ionizing radiation dose and exposure. A separate video is available to demonstrate how to use the self-reading dosimeter. Here's a recap of the different radiation monitoring devices used at Chester County Reception Centers. There are two categories of radiation detection equipment used at the Chester County Reception Centers. The categories are essentially monitoring either activity or dose. Activity can be thought of as how quickly the material emits radiation. Instruments commonly used to measure activity are called count rate meters. The two detection devices that measure activity are the portal monitor and handheld ludlum. The portal monitor alarms at one microcurie, which is set at the factory and tested every quarter. The handheld ludlum must be viewed to watch for counts per minute at 300 or above. A dose is a measure of the energy deposited from the radiation into material or tissue. Dose rate is a measure of dose per unit time. The overall dose received depends on the dose rate and how long one is exposed. Two detection devices measure dose, the SRD and PRD. Both dose monitoring devices use a radiation-absorbed dose, or RAD, to measure ionizing radiation dose and exposure. The RAD exposure limits will be explained in a separate video. Nuclear power plant owners, government agencies, state, and local officials, as well as thousands of volunteers and first responders, have worked together to create a system of emergency preparedness and response that will serve the public well in the unlikely event of an emergency. The nuclear power plant's emergency preparedness instructions include evacuation, sheltering, or other actions to protect the residents nearby in a severe incident. Since commercial nuclear power plants began operating in the United States, there have been no physical injuries or fatalities from exposure to radiation from the plants among members of the U.S. public. Even the country's worst nuclear power plant accident at Three Mile Island resulted in no identifiable health impacts. Again, it's important to note that the evidence of six decades shows that nuclear power is a safe means of generating electricity. This video was brought to you by Chester County Emergency Management Agency in South Carolina. You can find other radiological training videos on the Chester County Emergency Management YouTube channel. Subscribe to our channel for future releases of training and exercise videos.